الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم. It's my honor to be here today. I'm here every day, almost, but to be part of this great event organized by our dear brother Zija Ali, this annual Sira conference where we get together and we reflect over the life and the legacy of the one who's most important to us, the one who lives in our hearts, the one who we live for and we die for, that is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. This week in our hadith class, I see some of my hadith students here. We talked about an important teaching of the Prophet ﷺ where he reminded us that a deenun nasiha. That's this religion, the essence of our deen is nasiha. <clears throat> and nasiha does not necessarily mean advice, as some people think. But nasiha, as we reminded our students, is this sense of being loyal, this sense of being genuine this sense of being earnest and faithful and true. So the companions, they asked the Messenger of Allah, Nasiha to man, liman ya Rasulullah? Because they were thinking along the lines, you might be thinking, Nasiha is advice. Because that's how one of the ways it's used in language. And he said to them, Lillahi wa li kitabihi wa li rasulihi wa li a'immatil muslimina wa ammatihim. He said, Nasiha is something you owe to Allah, to His book, to His messenger, and to the Muslims, whether they're leaders or followers. So obviously, it doesn't mean advice. How do you advise Allah? Do you advise the messenger of Allah? Do you advise the book? No. Nasiha is that sense of being true, being real, being genuine, being faithful. So being real with Allah, being real with His book and being real and loyal and true and genuine towards the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Wasallam. What does that mean? Being loyal and genuine with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It means that when you say you love him, you have to be real with that. So the love cannot be a superficial love that's just lip service. It has to move beyond lip service. You have to be a true follower of the Messenger of Allah. And part of what we owe him in this sense of loyalty, this sense of genuineness, this nasiha for the Rasul, is that we clear his name from all that tarnishes his blessed name. And there is so much in the world that tarnishes his name, that sullies his beautiful persona and his life and his ethics and his model, the way he lived his life. There's so much information or misinformation out there, so much in terms of fake news. Today, all the rage is about fake news, fake reports. There's so much that affected the persona of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me begin by sharing with you a quote from a book that I read. I read a very interesting book called Thomas Jefferson's Quran some years ago. It was a book published when Trump came to office, when there was a debate about the role of Muslims and whether they fit in this country or not. So this author, Dennis Spellberg, he wrote a book about the engagement of the Founding Fathers, in particular Thomas Jefferson, with Islam. It was a limited engagement, but Thomas Jefferson, he had a copy of the Quran. It was a, it was a translation from a non-Muslim, not the best. I mean, what can you imagine in the 1700s, what kind of translations were there? And he had personal notes in that book, so he was actually reading the Quran, and he had notes on the side, and they actually had some things to say about Islam. They had interactions with Muslim slaves. They had interactions with parts of the Muslim world. So they, Islam was very much, I wouldn't say it was central to them, but it was part of their imagination. It was part of what they thought about the world. And there's a quote, I don't want to talk about the book, but there was one quote that stood out for me and I never got over it. There's a quote in there from John Leland, John Leland was the minister, the imam of Thomas Jefferson. He was a Baptist minister. And him and Thomas Jefferson, they're the ones who crafted this idea that all religions should be safe in this society. Um, and their work led to the Bill of Rights. But anyway, John Leland wrote, and he said in one of his articles, he was talking about diversity in the world. But there's a quote that just stood out for me. 
He said, it is an article in Al-Quran. That's how they wrote about the Quran at the time. A-L-C-O-R-A-N, Al-Quran. He said, it will remind a man of an article in Al-Quran that the world stands upon a great ox. And you, did maybe you might, what is he talking about? Yes, I said ox, the animal, the cow, the ox. So it reminds a man of, it will remind a man, it will remind man of an article in Al-Quran that the world rests upon a great ox. The ox stands upon a great stone and the stone rests upon the shoulders of an angel and the angel stands upon God knows what. Just let that sink in, think about that for a moment. So among the founding fathers, they were intelligent people, they were philosophers, <clears throat> they wrote so much. One of them, and he was Thomas Jefferson's um, minister and colleague and friend, he actually wrote something like this, that the Quran has a major article of faith that the world is on an ox. So first of all, is there any such verse? I mean, some might think, oh, maybe I missed that part. Maybe there is a verse. I mean, but with this community, mashallah, has so many hufad. You know, this community produces people who memorize Quran. My two daughters are, are a result of this community as well. So you, the hufad will tell you, of course there's no such verse. The world's resting upon the shoulders of an ox. So anyway, I dismissed that. I, you know, initially for me it was just, you know, it was a time of ignorance. It was a time when people didn't know much about Islam. We didn't do our job. Um, and Islam was not translated into the English language as much yet. But then something still stuck with me over time. I kept thinking that there has to be a reason for things. Things don't just come out of the blue, right? There has to be, where did they get that from? They must have got it from somewhere. They, he wouldn't make that up. They were intelligent people. Why would they just make up something from nowhere? So there must have been some source. And it took me a couple of years to find the source. And that source was when you open up, and you can do it now if you like, open up Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Not a small Tafsir. Open up the chapter Surah An-Nun. Surah An-Nun. Wal Qalami wa Ma Yasturun. The beginning of that chapter. The very first thing Imam Ibn Kathir says, Noon, wa huwa hutun azim fi bahrin azim, bahril muhit, ala tayyar al ma. He says, Noon is the name of a massive whale that is, you know, swimming on the currents of a great ocean. That's the first thing Ibn Kathir shares in this tafsir. And then he spends about a page and a half sharing various hadith, various reports with Isnad going back or supposedly going back to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam. And there are various such hadith. Um, they have different features and different, but the, the idea is kind of the same. So for instance, one of the hadith says that the first thing Allah created was water. And then after the water, Allah created a whale, a great whale, a great fish. And then Allah created the earth. And then he rests the earth on that whale. And then every time the whale moved, then earthquakes happened. So then Allah put the mountains in the earth to settle the earth so it wouldn't move on the back of that whale. This is a hadith that's in the Mustadrak of Imam al-Hakim. And sorry to say, he says this hadith is sahih on the conditions of Bukhari and Muslim, for instance. It, of course, it's not the case. Would you believe such a hadith today? Um, and then Ibn al-Qayyim talks about that hadith. And he says there's another hadith that's related to that. And he says this is a hadith where Allah Azza, or the Prophet reportedly said, إِنَّ الْأَرْضَ عَلَى سَخْرَةٍ وَالسَّخْرَةُ عَلَى قَرْنِ ثَوْرٍ The earth rests upon a great stone. And the stone rests upon the horns of an ox. And then, فَإِذَا حَرَّكَ الثَّوْرُ قَرْنَهُ تَحَرَّكَتِ sahra. Whenever that ox animal moves, the stone moves, and then تَحَرَّكَتِ الْأَرْضُ And then the earth moves that we live upon, وَهِيَ zalzala. And that's why earthquakes happen. This is a hadith. It's in the books. 
You'll find reference to that even in Tafsir Ibn Kathir. So thinking of that idea, I'm here to talk about clearing his blessed name, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So what would you think about that? I just want you to keep that, that image in mind, and we'll come back to that. But to understand that, you really need to understand, go back to the basic um, a philosophical understanding of the world. Allah created this world with many voices. From one perspective, the life that we live, this hayat dunya is just a life of so many voices. Close your eyes and just listen to all the voices around you. Everywhere you go, you hear things. You're in your car, you turn on the radio, you hear things. Information. You go to the supermarket, you hear people talking. You go everywhere around the world, you watch, you switch the channels, all sorts of people talking and talking and talking. There's so many voices in the world. Allah created a world full of many, many voices. And these voices is part of the test of life. And he tells us there's two competing voices in the world. There's a voice of God, and then there's a voice of shaitan. Those are the two basic voices in the world. All other voices stem from those sources. The voice of God comes through revelation. So Allah, when He created Adam from day one, what did He say to Adam salam when He sent him to live in this earth? He said, you will live in this earth, but don't worry. I will be sending you guidance from time to time. I will be sharing my voice through guidance, through revelation with human beings from time to time. Those who follow that voice, the voice of guidance, they have nothing to worry. No fear on them and no sorrow for the past. So. The world is full of voices, but then you have alternate voices. At the same time Adam was sent to the world, who else was created and sent to the same planet? Iblis, alayhi la'ana. Iblis, shaitan, was sent to live in this world, and he promised Allah that I will never leave human beings alone. I will come to them from the front, from the back, from the side, from the, I will, and you will find that most of them will not be grateful. So shaitan will come in this world, and he did come in this world, with his own voices. Allah talks about the voice of shaitan in the Quran. In seven verses, Allah talks about the, verse, the voice of shaitan through the word ghurur, deception. وَغَرَّكُمْ بِاللَّهِ الْغَرُورِ The great deceiver is the one who is going to deceive you about Allah. So the voice of truth, the voice of God is revelation. The voice of shaitan is deception. Seven verses speak about ghurur. And uh, shaitan is called the great deceiver, al ghurur So these are the two voices we have in the world, the clear voice of guidance. Then we have the voices that take you away from guidance, and they're nothing but deception. Now the voice of God comes through revelation through the prophets. So Allah chooses prophets and He sends His revelation. But every prophet, Allah says in one of these verses, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَا لِكُلِّ نَبِيٍ عَدُوًّا شَيَاطِينَ الْإِنسِ وَالْجِنِ We created, we sent prophets. But every single prophet, we created for them enemies, shayateen, al-insi wal-jinn. Every single prophet had an enemy, had an arch nemesis. And these enemies were either shayateen from ins or jinn. They were those that whisper in the hearts of men, the devils, and they were from human beings that opposed the revelation. And then Allah says, what does He say? Yuhi ba'duhum ila ba'din ghurura. These devils, these enemies of the prophets, they whisper to one another with the deceptive, the elegant words of deception. That's what I want you to think about. Zukhruf al-qawli ghurura. Deception, first of all, their words are deceptive, but they're elegant. Zukhruf is like a jewel. So these voices of deception often seem very nice. They seem like, you know, they're, 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 they're coming from the good, right sort. Because shaitan is not just restful. He doesn't rest with just saying that this is my message. I oppose the messengers. But part of the boldness of these shayateen 
is that they begin to speak in the name of the messengers. So they come and they say, this is what the messenger said. Had it been just from Iblis, it would be clear. This is Iblis speaking, this is Allah speaking. This is the shayateen, these are the prophets. But they, would not, they, were not rest with, they, they did not rest with that. They had the boldness and the audacity to speak in God's name. And they began to delude the followers of them. They did that with Musa. They did that with Isa. The verses of the Quran are filled with that. With Isa, it got so bad that all the followers were deluded into thinking that Isa came and he wanted people to worship him. And he was the son of God, one of a triune. So it was so bad that even Allah shares what will happen on the day of judgment with Isa alayhi salam. Allah says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the ending of Surah Al-Ma'idah, وَإِذْ قَالَ اللَّهُ يَا عِيسَى بْنَ مَرْيَمْ أَأَنْتَ قُلْتَ لِلنَّاسِ اتَّخِذُونِي وَأُمِّيَ إِلَهَيْنِ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ when Allah on the day of judgment will call and say, Ya Isa ibn Maryam, were you the one who told your people to worship you and your mother as gods alongside Allah? And he would say, Qala subhanak, glory be to you, I never said such a thing. And he repudiated that. And in the next verse he said, Ma qultu lahum illa ma amartani bihi, Allah. I did not say to them that my voice to them was only one voice. To worship Allah without any partners. So here in these verses, we is very clear that the prophets, they were sent with the voice of God. Then the shayateen, they are going to try to tarnish that voice with their alternate voices. And hence, the need to clear the names of the prophets. Now, they did that with our prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or they tried to do that with our prophet. The difference with our ummah was that Allah guaranteed the preservation of revelation. Inna nahnu nazzalna dhikra wa inna lahu lahafidhun. We are the ones who reveal this reminder to you. We are responsible for protecting it. So Allah chose blessed individuals in this ummah to preserve the message of guidance. So that's the difference between our ummah. We have a sophisticated system and a whole movement of people who stood up to clear his name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the greatest of these, the greatest person who did this job in the best way to clear his name, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was a man today, every khutbah, almost every speech in the world, from his time until now for the last thousand years. Everywhere, in every corner of the world, his name, goes along with the name of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. There's no one else that has that honor. No other human being has the honor where the speech begins with qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The first thing that you say is the messenger of Allah said and then the last thing you say rawahul bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala imam al-bukhari related. So just think about that honor for a moment. This was a man who did the best job in clearing the name of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah gifted him with having his name attached to the name of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Rasulullah comes first, the end of the hadith, Rawahu al-Bukhari, and others, but Bukhari is the one who's unanimously accepted. Now he, what was the motivation of Imam al-Bukhari? His motivation was that he had a dream. And he said he saw in a dream, and he didn't understand what the dream meant. He saw that he was following the Messenger of Allah with a f handheld fan. And he said, I was warding off flies, walking behind the Messenger, and warding off flies from him. And he didn't understand what it meant, but it stuck with him. He kept thinking, what, what does this mean? Until one day, <clears throat> he was sitting in the class of his teacher, the great Hadith expert, Ishaq ibn Rahawai. And Ishaq was a hadith expert who was also involved in clearing the messenger's name. He said, Lo jama'atum kitaban muhtasaran min sahih sunnati Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He said, I wish one of you were to clear the Prophet's name, so to speak, and to just compile the authentic sunnah of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Imam al Bukhari said, Fa waqara dhalika fi qalbi. That settled in my heart and I realized what my mission was. And I began to author my Sahih. So he began to author his book. 
and he embarked on this project to clear the Prophet's name. And the rest of the moments that we have, I want to share with you from the methodology of Imam al-Bukhari, amazing, sophisticated methodology, how he cleared the Prophet's name and the movement that he started, we're still better off today because of that. So he looked at it from many different angles. So he came up with, or the summary of his methodology, with there were five conditions that make a hadith sahih. What are those five conditions? Only the students who memorize them, they know them. Otherwise, you have to reason it out. Imam al-Bayquni says, فَالْأَوَّلُ الصَّحِيهُ وَهُوَ مَتَّصَلْ إِسْنَادُهُ وَلَمْ يُشَذَّ أَوْ يُعَلْ يَرْوِيهِ عَدْلٌ ضَابِطٌ عَنْ مِثْلِهِ مُعْتَمَدٌ فِي ضَبْدِهِ وَنَقْلِهِ It's a beautiful, sophisticated methodology. And it's a methodology, if you reflect over what these conditions were, it makes perfect sense. And even in modern times today, when we're surrounded by fake news, we're surrounded by WhatsApp messages. Right now, the, the norm in WhatsApp, when you get a message that is fake, that, you know, when all these people share these different things on WhatsApp or all these social media forums, now we're living in a time where the majority of information is incorrect. So now you just have to assume that this is wrong, this is a scam, someone's trying to trick you into something. That's the reality of the world we live in. But even today, we deal with this false information through similar methodologies. So what were the, some of these things? Um, number one, and I'll share with you each condition and just share with you what happens when you violate that condition and what kind of information is out there that violates that condition. So the first angle Imam al-Bukhari looked at was that he analyzed reports from a historical lens. In other words, Muslims realized early on when someone stood up and spoke in the name of God in the name of the messenger, there has to be a reference. You have to have a source. So in the time of the Sahaba, you know, the scholar, they realized all this false information was being spread in the name of the Prophet, in the name of Islam. So they, there was a rallying cry. Muhammad ibn Sirin was the, one of the first, and he died in 110. So he lived, he was a tabari. He lived in the time of the Sahaba when they were still alive. So he stood up and he used to say, Sammu lana rijalakum. Whenever someone shared information, tell us your source. Who are your teachers? And that instituted or started a movement of developing the system of isnad. So now you couldn't just share information, you had to reference it. Okay, you said that you heard, well, you said the Prophet ﷺ said this. Where'd you hear that from? Who was your teacher? And then who was his teacher? And going back to the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. In the time of Ibn Sirin, it would have been only two links. Ibn Sirin saw companions. So it would have been two or three links. So this was the first step you had to take when there's a report coming to the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It had to have been heard from someone going back to the Prophet in an unbroken chain. So there was a historical method. What happens when you bypass that historical method? Here's an example. Now each one I'll share with you prominent fake reports about the Prophet that you might have heard. There's a hadith of the Prophet that I heard quite a bit growing up in the 80s. Utlubul ilm walau bisseen. Seek knowledge even if it takes you as far as China. How many of you have heard that hadith? Seek knowledge even if it takes you as far as China. So this hadith is related by Khatib al-Baghdadi through various chains that goes through a man by the name of Abu Atika. And he says that Anas bin Malik reported that the Prophet وسلم, reportedly said this. Now, the problem here is, you have to look at historically who each individual was. Imam al-Bukhari, he analyzed it, and among others, all the Hadith experts analyzed Abu Atika was someone who never met Anas bin Malik. So he was spreading information in the name of Anas bin Malik and he lived much later. So there's a broken link. This chain is not established to the Messenger of Allah. So this hadith is not sound. And the experts of hadith, all of them say this hadith is fabricated. The Prophet ﷺ did not say these words. In Lil Asaf, we still share information like that today. We're not careful. 
It is not in Sahih al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari rejected it. He clearly rejected it. And he made it clear that the narrator, one of the Abu Atika is Munkar al-Hadith. Imam al-Bukhari, he's someone who's, Munkar means evil. But it means someone who makes up hadith that contradict principles of Islam. So this is not a sound hadith, although we want it to be sound. Remember that idea, Zukhruf al qawli ghurura? This, uh, um, what was the translation? The, the, the golden words of deception or captivating words of deception. It sounds so cool. It's one of the best hadith you can share for when Tanwir does an interfaith. He's always pressured. That's what's going to come in his mind. Let me share this with the non-Muslims. Such a beautiful hadith. Even as far as China, our prophet was into education. But then suppose someone comes up with information. Well, China was never discovered. In the, you know, it, was, it was something unknown to those people. Then it just shatters your foundation. But more importantly, did the prophet say it or not? Isn't that important to us? According to Imam al-Bukhari and the hadith expert, they're almost unanimous that this hadith is not sound. It is fabricated. So this is how you clear the Prophet's name. Through the methodology, respecting the methodology of the great hadith experts, like Imam al-Bukhari. Now, there are many other hadith that violate this, but in the interest of time, we have till 2.15, right? Oh, 2.30. Okay, I have half an hour. Okay. You guys ready? Okay, so there's another hadith that's, uh, that's also um, has a violation in the chain. So there's a hadith that goes through an isnad to Salman al-Farisi, reportedly. And Salman al-Farisi, he said, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, one day, قَالَ لِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ يَا سَلْمَانَ لَا تُبْغِدْنِي فَتُفَارِقَ دِينَكَ don't hate me or you will lose your faith. And Salman al-Farisi, he asked the Messenger of Allah, how could anyone hate you, Ya Rasulullah? And he said to them, تُبْغِدُ Arab, فَتُبْغِدُنِي You will hate the Arabs and then thereby you will hate me. So this hadith maybe is not that captivating, maybe it's not that alluring, maybe it's not a good hadith for interfaith. Might be a good hadith when there was an era of Arab nationalism in the 70s and all the countries around were like, that was a big thing. And hadith like this were being shared. So this particular hadith, what's the problem? The problem here, again, there's a missing link. And who came to the rescue? Imam al-Bukhari, to clear the Prophet's name. He said one of the narrators, Abu Dhabiyan lam yudrik Salman. So this is narrated by Qabus from his father, from Salman, from the Prophet. But Qabus, first of all, was a weak narrator. He made a lot of mistakes. Then his father never met Salman. So when you have a clear missing link, a generational gap, you have no idea where this person received the hadith from. It's a missing link. It doesn't establish that it's not. The most important condition for the reliability of a report is to be unbroken in terms of having people who heard from someone who heard, from someone who heard, going back to Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's the first condition. It makes perfect sense. If someone's sharing information, you have to ask them, where do you get it from? And then you have to investigate further, where did that person get it from? Going back to the source. So that's the first, historical, right? And I shared with you two examples where hadith would violate that. Now another thing they looked at, Imam al-Bukhari realized, and the great experts, they realized it's not enough to have an unbroken chain. What if someone's a bad guy? He has bad moral character. He might have ulterior motives. He might be someone who has an agenda. And someone like that, he'll say, I heard it from this person, and that person heard it from that person, all the way, he'll have that unbroken chain. So you might have the entire chain there, but now you have to have to look at the moral character of each person. That was also very, very important. So Ibn Sirin in the Muqaddimah Imam Muslim, he says, Sammu lana rijalakum. He said, we need to ask people who are your teachers. Then we need to see the second step, who those teachers were. 
if there were people from Ahlul Bid'ah, and by that he meant people who had other agendas, and they opposed the Sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, then they have a lapse in their moral character, and we can't take their information. So this was very, very important as well, looking at the moral character. So the first thing is dubbed, or the first thing is having the unbroken chain, the historical analysis. Then second thing, you have to have a moral judgment on each narrator, looking at it from a moral lens. And there are several examples. There's a prominent example, Ma'moon ibn Ahmad al-Sulami. He was a scholar from Herat, Afghanistan. So he has a number of hadith. One of the hadith he shares is that um, he says, with his chain, so Ma'moon ibn Ahmad from Herat al-Harawi means he was from Afghanistan, and he lived early on. So he related hadith with his isnad. He says that the Prophet reportedly said, "Yakunu fi ummati rajulun, yuqalu lahu Muhammad ibn Idris." There will be a man in my ummah. His name will be Muhammad ibn Idris. And then he says, "Adarru ahadun ala ummati min iblis." More dangerous for my ummah than iblis. Who was Muhammad bin Idris? What was that name of? Imam al-Shafari. Hadith, the Prophet, there will be a man in my ummah named Muhammad bin Idris. He will be more dangerous to the ummah than Iblis. And then the rest of the hadith, وَيَكُونُ فِي أُمَّتِي رَجُلٌ يُقَالُ لَهُ أَبُو حَنِيفَةً Then there will be a man by the name of Abu Hanifa who was Siraj Ummati and he will be the light of my ummah. This is a hadith that he shared. Mamun ibn Ahmad. Okay, and it's in our books. You might say, well, of course it's not in Bukhari and Muslim. Yes, of course they rejected it. But I will testify before you, I read this hadith in a book in the 80s in a masjid that was shared on the virtue of Abu Hanifa. And the book did not say it was fabric. It was using that hadith. It is still being published today. Still being spread today in the ummah. Okay, you have to think, what, what makes people do things like that? So Ma'moon ibn Ahmad, so Ibn Hibban was a great hadith expert. So he, he lived very early on. So he went and investigated. Like he was spreading hadith like that. And one of the hadiths he spread was, Man rafa' yadayhi fi salah fala salat Allah. And the Prophet said, whoever raises his hand in salah, rafa' yadayn, there is no salah for him. It doesn't count. Because that debate, you have to think what's going on. The debates between Hanafi school and the Shafi'i school. And then they went to the level of inventing hadith about the Prophet So Ibn Hibban, he investigated the matter. So he went and met this man from Afghanistan. And he said to him, so the hadith he narrates, it comes from Hisham Ibn Ammar, great scholar of Syria. So he's investigating, the hadith has unbroken chains. So he went to um, Mamun Ibn Ahmad, and he asked him, you, you narrate this hadith from Hisham Ibn Ammar, when did you meet Hisham Ibn Ammar? He said, I met him in the year 250. Ibn Hibban says, well, wait a minute. Hisham ibn Ammar died in 245. So then he said to him, you think he's the only one named Hisham ibn Ammar? <laughs> so he, he made a comeback. He said, that was a different Hisham ibn Ammar. So then he realized this was a liar. So he went back and he spread the word, this man is a liar. He has an agenda. He is kathab. And they even called him Dajjal. Dajjal mina Dajjajila. So that's a prominent example of hadith that were spread in the Prophet's name. But thankfully, our scholars, they rose to the challenge. And they made, they made, you know, they, they cleared the Prophet's name. However, there are still many of us that continue to spread this false information. That's a tragedy. That's why we need a lecture like this today. That's why topics like this are important to understand the work of these hadith experts who embarked on this project to clear the messenger's name. Another example of the moral lapse. There's an even funnier example. How many of you heard of, there's a companion that was from India, supposedly. His name was Baba Ratan. There's a companion who was from India, from a village in India, Baba Ratan. He died in the year 700 something. So he died 700, some 700 years after the Hijrah. But he claimed to be a companion. 
And he gives a long story that when the moon split, I went to Arabia, or I went to Arabia, I met a young boy and he was tending his sheep and he was trying to cross, there was a stream and he was too young to cross. So I picked him up on my shoulders and I made him cross and he said something to me seven times in his language that I didn't understand. And that the, it was a dua for a long life. And then I put him back down and then I came back. Seven times that person said this dua to him and he lived for 700 years. And that was Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi in his childhood. And then he said later on in the, in, in, in when the Prophet was in Medina, I went to Medina again for trade, for business. And I came upon his masjid and I entered upon the masjid and the Prophet said to me, Oh Baba Ratan, do you remember me? I am the one you helped cross across that river. And then he embraced Islam and he came back to India and spread Islam. And this was in the year 700 when he was telling this story. 700 years after the Prophet, he's telling this story. And he's sharing all these hadith with his isnad. Baba Ratan, the Sahabi from India. And one of the hadith he shares, and it still, still might be out there, he shares a hadith with an isnad, a short isnad, because he's a companion, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi reportedly said, Al-Buka'u fi yawmi Ashura nurun tamun yawm al qiyamah The one who cries on the day of Ashura will have complete light on the day of judgment. Another hadith he shared, Ma min abdin yabki yawma qatlil Hussein illa kana yawm al qiyamati ma'a ulil azmi min al rusul There is no man that uh, cries on the day that Hussein was killed except that on the day of judgment he will be with the ulul azm the five greatest messengers in their company so this is a man who shared hadith like this and he lived in the year 700 something so imam al-dhahbi said it best he said um, he said about this man he said that the one who claims or who believes these man saddaqa bi hadhihi al-ajuba wa amana bi baqa'i ratan the one who believes the lies of this man from India. And Dhahabi lived in his time. This is the time of Imam Dhahabi. And he claims to be a Sahabi. If anyone believes him, then I have no treatment for him. There is no medicine that can help that person if you believe a person like that. Imam Dhahabi is saying these words. And then he says, Know that I am the first one to reject this person. And that anyone who believes him, there's no way I can debate him because there's no way I can win such a debate. Because that person's mind is not sound. How can you debate a person who believes things like this? Okay. What's the big deal? If you Google YouTube Baba Ratan, there are so many ulama in India and Pakistan that are sharing his story. And people are saying, subhanAllah in the audience, believing it. Wallahi Azim. I was shocked when I first did that. So, and there's where he died in India, there's a shrine. People visit that for Tabarruk. So the many scholars from our region, they still hold on to his story. And they share it. And it's a pride for them that we have a Sahabi who came from India. But like, look at what Imam al-Dhahabi says. If you believe such a thing, then you need help. But no one can really help you. No one can even debate you. And he said, I can't even win such a debate with a person like that. So this is a moral laugh. Someone who's like that is a clear liar. Someone with an agenda. If you look at their hadith they're inventing, they also have an agenda in those hadith. You know, it's supporting certain concepts. Okay, moving on. Now, sometimes there's an academic... Um, so Imam al-Bukhari, the first thing he looked at was historical, right? From a historical angle. Then he looked at it from a moral angle. Then he looked at it from an academic angle. Because he realized that, you know, okay, they might not be liars. There might be an unbroken chain. But everyone's memory is different, right? Sometimes people just, their memory isn't the best. So there are various hadith that people share. Though they started investigating that narrators, were they good students? Or were they known to mix up things? There are so many people that mix up things when they tell stories every time the story is slightly different, right? That's not someone with academic accuracy. This is called dubbed. Imam al-Bukhari and others, this was a remarkable contribution of theirs to this field. So just a quick example, and I'll be more quick. Um, there's a hadith shared by, it's in a tirmidhi 
But Imam al when he shares hadith, it doesn't necessarily mean he thinks they're sound. Sometimes he, he, he shares them because they're being used, but he comments at the end that they're unsound. So just because it's in Tirmidhi, don't think that, well, Imam Tirmidhi accept, accepted it. It's a hadith with his isnad to Khalid ibn Tahman from Nafir ibn Abin Nafir, from Ma'qal ibn Yasar, from the Prophet and I'll share with you the meaning in English. Whoever recites three times waking up in the morning, isti'adha, and then the last three verses of Surah Al-Hashr, Allah will appoint 70,000 angels to pray for that person until the evening. And if he were to die that day, he will die a shaheed. And the same for those who recite them at night. So, for some of you, oh, beautiful meaning. And these are the kind of hadith that make it to WhatsApp. So people share these on WhatsApp and share all, oh, do this three times and 70,000 angels praying for you. So the problem here is, there are many problems. But one of the problems is Khalid ibn Tahman. You know, the scholars, they realized when they investigated his life that he was someone, when he got older, he began to mix up hadith. In the last 10, of, 10 years of his life, he was teaching as an older person, just mixing up information. So then all of these scholars, they began to leave his hadith. They couldn't trust him. Because even though the isnad is there, but now he's just mixing up maybe the names, he mixed up the names. So that was also a very important thing to look at. Look at the accuracy of the reporters and the narrators. So there are many, many hadith like that, that where, in fact, the majority of weak hadith, or hadith that people are, are disputed, some people accept them, but a lot of the hadith experts don't. When you look at the narrator, they weren't the best students. They were known to mix up things. They were known not to be academically accurate in preserving the wording. So that was very, very important. So you have historic, you have moral, you have this um, academic, way of looking at things, of corroborating reports. So those are the three main ones. Right? But now, you could stop here, and that kind of is enough for most people. If you, there's an unbroken chain. So historically, every person heard from the other person. You verified that. And every person has good moral character. You verified that. And every single person is accurate. They also have good memory. They're not known to be people who mix up things. They're senile, or so on and so forth. All the parameters fit. It still was not enough for Imam al-Bukhari because he wanted to clear the Prophet's name, um, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. So they brought an extra level of scrutiny to the equation, which is called Ailal. And that's something remarkable. That is, hadith fits everything, but there's something about it that's off. They keep searching until they find the hidden defect. And that's what Ailal is. It's a fine science. Not every scholar can engage in it. Most hadith scholars did not know it very well. Only the best experts were able to engage in that level of scrutiny. So there's a great hadith that people quote as an example of that. So it's a hadith in Tirmidhi. Uh, Nuaim ibn Hamad relates from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, from Abu Zinad, from A'raj, from Abi Huraira. So Nuaim relates a hadith from Sufyan ibn Uyayna, the great hadith scholar of Mecca. He re relates from A'raj, from Abu Zinad, or from Abu Zinad, from Araj, from Abu Huraira. This is the strongest isnad for the hadith of Abu Huraira. For some scholars, it's the strongest isnad that exists in the world, on this planet. Hadith that comes from Abu, Z Abu Huraira, through his best student Araj, through his best student Abu Zinad. This hadith fits that. It has the strongest isnad, if you're just looking at the names. So what did the Prophet ﷺ reportedly say? إِنَّكُمْ فِي زَمَانٍ مَنْ تَرَكَ مِنْكُمْ عُشْرَ مَا أُمِرَ بِهِ هلك. You are living in a time today where if you were to leave one-tenth of the deen, you will be destroyed. ثُمَّ يَأْتِي زَمَانٌ مَنْ عَمِلَ مِنْهُمْ بِعُشْرِ مَا أُمِرَ بِهِ نجا. But soon there will come a time where if you only practice 10% of your faith, you will be saved. So it sounds plausible, right? It shows the decline of religious practice over time. And the isnad is solid. It's one of the strongest isnads. It's in the book of Tirmidhi. So scholars, they still, the hadith experts of that time, they didn't accept it. There, there was something wrong. They couldn't accept it. Part of it is the meaning. Would the prophet ever say, if you practice 10% of the deen, you will be saved? Are we allowed to? Okay, there's five prayers. Just If you pray one, you're okay. Pray as many as you can. Just pray one for the day. Or these are your commandments, 
2.5% of zakah, just, okay, if you can't do it all, just give a little bit, give 1%, and that's enough. So like, you can imagine the meanings, right? Our, so the scholars, they analyze this hadith, and they kept, so Nu'aim was the problem here. So Sufyan is not a problem. These are solid, it's not. They kept asking Nu'aim, did you hear this from Sufyan? And he said, yes, I, I swear by Allah, I heard Sufyan say these words. And then the scholars went back, they said, okay, that's good enough for us. And it's part of our hadith books, and people quote this hadith today. But some of the experts, they kept digging, and they asked Sufyan, so some of them, they said to Sufyan, uh, to uh, Nu'aim rather, okay, you heard from Sufyan, we believe you, but tell us what was going on at that time, they, there must have been something. So he said, basically, we were sitting in class, and there are thousands of students of Sufyan in Mecca and Masjid al-Haram, and somebody did something in the audience that Sufyan got annoyed with. And then he paused for a moment and he continued teaching. And he said these words. Then that hadith actually he realized what happened. Sufyan is sitting in class, he's narrating hadith, relating his nad, and then maybe someone you know, did something that distracted him and he got annoyed. And then he said these words. He must have said these words out of annoyance. And then the students who are sitting down, they're not that careful looking at the circumstances. They're writing down continuously what he's saying. And they put that isnad with this hadith. Whereas it was a parenthetical comment from Sufyan. So it is not something that the Prophet could have said. Sallallahu So they cleared his name. So they did not, Bukhari did not accept this hadith. Although Nu'aim was a teacher of Bukhari. This Nu'aim who wrote this hadith down, he was a teacher of Bukhari. Bukhari used his hadith in his sahih. But he didn't use this one because he knows that there was a mistake. Even though everything fits, there's still something about it that's off. And that deeper investigation reveals these subtle hidden defects. So can you doubt hadith today when you have this level of scrutiny, this level of rigor that our scholars brought to the equation? Five minutes, inshallah. So there are many, many hadith like that. Um, finally, the last thing. So all of these notwithstanding, there still could be a possibility that this nad is there, everything fits, they can't find a defect, but then it contradicts something. So suppose someone brings you a hadith and contradicts something from the Quran. So Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he looked at this hadith, Inna al-arda ala sakhratil ma, the hadith that we began with and will end with, that's a subtle, that's a, an appropriate end. The world stands upon the horns of an ox, the ox is standing upon a stone, the stone stands upon God knows what. Um, or that's what John Leland said, but the stone stands upon, uh, is in the ocean, and every time this ox moves, and there are versions that talk about a whale. So what did Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he said, Walla ajabu. And he puts this hadith in it, he has a remarkable book on recognizing fabricated hadith. So he says, sometimes the hadith just contradicts what you know. And everything else might fit, and that is called shad. And that's something where you can't, the hadith is rejected because it contradicts stronger evidence. We know the world is not on an ox. That doesn't make any sense for Ibn al-Qayyim. Earlier scholars, they didn't really think about it because they didn't have an understanding of the world. But by the time of Ibn al-Qayyim, the great scholar, he, he realized that this is nonsense. This is ridiculous. So he said some famous words. He says, Wal-ajab min musawwidi kutubahu bihadihil hadaynat. He said, I am so amazed. I am so flabbergasted by those who would fill their books with these delusions, these deliriums. He called this hadith a delirium, a delusion. It can never be. And he also said, about some similar, about this hadith and others, he said, وَلَيْسَ الْعَجَبُ مِنْ جُرْعَةِ مِثْلَ هَذَا الْكَذَّابِ عَلَى اللَّهِ He says, I'm not amazed by the boldness of liars when they attribute lies to the Prophet ﷺ. إِنَّمَا الْعَجَبُ مِمَّنْ يُدْخِلُ هَذَا الْحَدِيثِ فِي كُتُبِ الْعِلْمِ مِنَ التَّفْسِيرِ وَغَيْرِهِ but I'm really amazed by scholars who accept this information and they put it in their books of tafsir and fiqh without clarifying the reality of these narrations. So these are hadith that contradict for Ibn al-Qayyim and great scholars. All the scholars had some measure, some way of looking at that. And, you know, these are hadith that contradict known principles. Quickly, there are a number of examples, you know, so that people don't think I'm, think I'm picking on India. We had Baba Ratan from India, Mamun ibn Ahmad from Herat. 
There was, a, there was a person from Syria, Muhammad bin Sa'id. He fabricated a hadith that the Prophet said, Ana khatimun nabiyin, la nabiya ba'di illa in yasha Allah. So he said that the Prophet said, I am the seal of the Prophet, there is no Prophet after me except whom Allah wills. And this man, Muhammad bin Sa'id, eventually claimed to be a Prophet. So you can imagine, he was just a liar and he just invented this hadith and he was executed for that. Um, so these are examples where if you see a hadith like that, it contradicts the Qur'an, Khatimun Nabiyyin. Allah says he Khatimun Nabiyyin. And someone comes and adds something to that, you cannot accept that hadith. So in conclusion, my brothers and sisters, um, part of our what we owe the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alihi Wasallam, part of our love for him, part of our sincerity and loyalty for him, is that we're more careful about his name. And that really, as a medical doctor, it really bothers me. It pains me to the core of my soul. When people, they want medical treatment, they go to the best doctors. When they want an antibiotic, they want a medicine, they won't take expired medicine. They won't take stuff that might not work. But when it comes to your deen, which is more important than medicine, more important than the air you breathe, we're not careful. We'll just take anything that might have a semblance of hadith. Something says hadith, Okay, the Prophet might have said it, let's just use it. It sounds good, let's make uh, the Prophet have said it. We need to be more careful with our deen. We need to be careful with the name of the Messenger of Allah because you wind up hurting him. You wind up marring his message. You wind up being part of the voices of shaitan and not the voice of revelation. So let us be more mindful of that. And let us appreciate you know, the choosing of the Messenger that Allah sent with this clear guidance for humanity and how Allah chose individuals that rose up to clear His name. And let's continue that process. Let's appreciate the work of Imam al-Bukhari and others. May Allah bless all of us. May Allah make us followers of the voices of guidance and not the voices of shaitan. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa So if you have a question, we can talk, you can talk to him one-on-one. -on -one. Inshallah, we're on a tight schedule. Jazakumullah khair, uh, Dr. Abu Zaid, for, um, you know, we can only make dua that Allah puts more barakah in our time. So out of the time that we have, we can start, you know, uh, learning about the wonderful sciences in our deen. Uh, Dr. Abu Zaid has, in our community and for, you know, decades, he's been doing uh, various classes and intensives on hadith and it's so, so riveting to hear that perspective and uh, you know get a better appreciation with that a uh, couple of things so alhamdulillah this brings to a uh, conclusion the sessions we have one left which will be the Kahoot Sira competition urge all of you folks especially the youth to attend right now we're gonna break for uh, lunch uh, it will be on the first floor the kids have their own pizza section uh, the gents, we uh, we have food set up for you there as well. For the sisters, it's in the Musalla area. Um, let's try and finish by in half an hour and about 3 p.m. Mufti Niaz will set up here and we'll run the Sira uh, competition. I want to thank Dr. Abu Zaid, Imam Rauf, and Sheikh Shinawi today for their wonderful talks and yesterday, Qari Zahid and uh, uh, Sheikh Mateen and Mufti Niaz. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.